Good evening. I'm Merlin Tuttle, and I'm here this evening to talk about bats and disease. If you've been paying any attention at all lately to the news media when it comes to bats and disease, you know that bats are supposedly now the most dangerous animals on the planet. Even National Public Radio recently aired a statement saying that bats are arguably among the world's most dangerous animals. In that same story, they went on to say that bats carry viruses all over their bodies, in their spit, in their poop. Uh, when a bat fly, when bats are flying over in the sky, uh, there could be Ebola in that poop that lands on your shoulder. If you really believed all this, you wouldn't want bats anywhere near. Fortunately, this is gross exaggeration based largely on pure sensationalized speculation. And it's not really new, it's just a new cycle of this kind of, uh, we're calling it, an, the people doing it don't necessarily believe they're doing an anti-bat PR campaign, but that's what it amounts to. What's going on is a repetition of what was happening back in the 1970s. In 1971, the American Association for the Advancement of Science at one of their annual meetings concluded that bats were disappearing rapidly, ecologically essential, and in need of immediate help. But immediately after they came to that conclusion and started to launch a campaign to help bats, a scare campaign pretty much like what's going on today started and in just a very short time, almost everybody, at least in America, believed that, if, that most bats, most if not all bats, were rabid and that they would attack you, especially children. And in that climate, the whole idea of conserving bats was put on the shelf. Nobody wanted to touch conserving bats until I got involved in 1982. And in the meantime, there were major magazines like Family Circle and Good Housekeeping that had stories like Three Years of Terror, a real life ordeal. One of their stories claimed that a whole family was trapped in their home for three days and nights while a flock of attacking bats tried to get them. Now, what do we know from fact? What we know from fact is that people like me have been studying them for studying bats for a very long time, exposed to all these supposedly terrible things that can happen from bats, and we're all perfectly healthy. We do we take one precaution. Those of us who study bats are vaccinated against rabies. That's because like veterinarians, animals that we're handling sometimes bite in self-defense. But if you're not trying to handle bats, there's nothing to worry about. Or at least let's say it's so minuscule that it should be the last thing you're concerned with. I have personally handled hundreds of species of bats in countries all over the world. I've been surrounded by millions at a time in caves. I've only been protected against rabies, not against Ebola or MERS or SARS or any of these other things that you hear now that bats are supposedly be, being the source of, and I'm still healthy. And let me point out that overall, bats clearly have one of, the plant, one of our planet's finest records of living safely with people. We start out sharing caves, thatched huts, log cabins, with bats. We've been associated with bats for a very long time and we still are. For example, here in Austin where I live, bats have become one, a world famous tourist attraction. When our bats, a million and a half of them, first started moving into the Congress Avenue Bridge in the middle of town, everyone was warned that they were rabid and would attack. People panicked, they were signing petitions to have the bats eradicated, 
Austin was like the world center of scary stories about bats. From coast to coast, you could read about how hundreds of thousands of rabid bats were invading and attacking the people of Austin. Very reminiscent of some of this stuff that's coming out today. And yet, all we had to do, I convinced the city to put up small signs just saying, please don't handle the bats, and if you're bitten, seek medical attention. You should seek medical attention if you're bitten by any animal. But uh, if you don't handle bats, they're happy to leave you alone. Over the past 35 years, millions of people have come to Austin specifically to enjoy our bats. They've come in very close association with them during their spectacular emergencies. Not one single person has been attacked or harmed by one of our bats. Certainly, if anybody should know about bats being safe or dangerous, we in Austin should know by now. We'd be dying like flies if bats flying over were dropping poop that gave us Ebola. And back to that statement, let me point out that in world history, not one person is known to have ever contracted any disease from bat flying over and dropping poop on their shoulder. Now, with that introduction, let me take some questions. I'll be happy to answer anything I can. And helping me here is Teresa Nicta, who works with me. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. I see, see all these people joined in. Good. Sheila says she wants to move to Austin one day and volunteer. Good. <laughs> Question. Hello. <laughs> this is Paula. <laughs> um, how how old are bats? How long have they been around? How long have these, emer like what is an emerging disease when people talk about that? Okay, what is an emerging disease? Using the word emerging in front of a lot of these diseases is just a real handy PR ploy so far as I can tell. These diseases, diseases like Ebola, our beliefs have been around for millions of years. They're just so rare that we're only now discovering them. Ebola had, if you take, if you, let, let's for sake of argument, say that all the so-called emerging diseases actually come from bats and all deaths attributed to them are, can be attributed to bats. If you do that, you, you lump Hendra, Nipah, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Marburg, lump all these together. And in the last 20 years combined, they have killed fewer humans than die in the United States alone, annually, from drug-resistant bacteria, largely caught in hospitals. Now, where do we spend our money? This is something that really concerns me. U.S. Congress, a couple years ago, allocated $1.77 billion on, Ebo excuse me, on Ebola research. Hundreds of millions have been spent and are being spent on searches for viruses and bats. These viruses are not new. They've been here as long as we've been here and they're not likely to just now start causing outrageous new problems. They've never, we don't know of a single pandemic that ever occurred because of bats. I know someone's going to say, oh, but SARS did. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the book is still out even on SARS. There's lots of speculation, but nothing that you could call even close to being proof. June asked, do sick bats attack people? Good question. Do sick bats attack people? Even sick bats, even rabies sick bats, are very unlikely to attack. Dogs will often get the furious form of rabies, and when they do, they will attack. And that's where we get the idea that animals attack. Other animals will too, but bats when they become rabid, usually get a paralytic type of rabies and are more likely to act dumb and docile. 
but that's good reason not to pick them up. When they're acting that way, that may very well mean that they're sick. Of bats that you can find in unusual places on the ground or where you could easily pick them up and handle them, about 5% of those are rabid. But you don't have to worry about even those bats if you don't handle them. They bite in self-defense. I am very well aware that there's been a lot said about bats supposedly sneaking up and biting people in their sleep. My ex personal experience just totally contradicts the idea that bats are sneaking up biting people in their sleep or that we wouldn't know about it if we were bitten. A rabid animal tends, if it does bite, tends to bite and kind of hang on, not take a quick painless nip and fly away. Uh, so if you leave bats alone, there's extremely little likelihood that you're going to get anything from them. And in the United States, Europe, Australia, most of the developed world, rabies is the only thing you need to worry about. And let's put that in perspective. We're told often by people who want to frighten us. And, and you know, the people who want to frighten us, they're motivated, they're well motivated. It's lucrative frightening people about bats. First of all, let me point out that in all of the United States and Canada combined, only one to two people a year die of rabies from bats. Sure, I can legitimately tell you that most people who contract rabies in America get it from bats, but it's only one or two out of three or 400 million people. And uh, that's a pretty rare problem actually put in perspective, let, let me put rabies in perspective. Worldwide, more than 50,000 humans a year die of rabies from dogs. 99% of rabies in humans worldwide comes from dogs. And even in the two year period, 2013-14, when the Ebola outbreak was going on in West Africa, while it killed a little over 11,000 humans, in that same period, approximately 100,000 died of rabies from dogs and we didn't even hear about it. It's so commonplace it doesn't make news. So I hope I've at least put rabies a bit in perspective. June also asked, why are bats so important to the ecosystem? <clears throat> That's a big topic. <laughs> well, first of all, why are bats so important to the ecosystem? My first response is this. I would far rather reduce the number of pesticides used than chase off trying to find a cure for Ebola that's never threatened anybody in the United States. Uh, pesticides do threaten us. We started using pesticides on crops in about 1942 and within less than a decade we had almost doubled our crop losses. That's not much of a commentary for pesticide value. And to keep from losing even more, we have through time had to dramatically increase the volume and the toxicity of the pesticides we use. Today, there is abundant, maybe we'll have a whole webinar on this sometime, there's abundant evidence linking uh, pesticide use, especially the neurotoxins, of which there's 33 million pounds of neurotoxins put in the environment in the U.S. alone every year. There's lots of evidence linking those to cancer, to dementia, to Alzheimer's, to all, almost anything you can think of that ails humans. Uh, chronic disease, often partly triggered by these pesticides, is far more important in hu killing humans every year than all of these so-called emerging diseases combined. But it's a whole lot easier to save you from something that wasn't going to harm you to begin with than to tangle with the multi-billion dollar pesticide industry and have somebody coming down your neck uh, for s saying something that they don't like about a product that they're making a lot of money selling. Every time we lose, you know, our bats, at least in the United States and Europe, are nearly all of them insectivorous. 
and they have tr they make tremendous contributions in saving us money and not just saving us money but saving our protecting our health because for example a paper in science just a few years ago concluded that on average conservatively America's bats are probably saving us 23 million dollar billion dollars annually in avoided pesticide use and right here in Texas, the species that comes out of our Congress Avenue bridge is an amazingly valuable creature. These guys in the springtime when corn earworm and army worm and other pests that are billion dollar crop pests in America, as they migrate in to this country, our bats, our free tail bats, are flying thousands of feet above ground sometimes traveling at up to a hundred miles an hour to reach good feeding places and they're going up there nabbing these moths that are egg laden one bat can catch enough moths in a single evening to prevent them from laying up to twenty thousand or more eggs that would otherwise force a texas farmer to spray multiple acres with pesticides that then would pollute your food and water and our environment and that's just the beginning, but I've talked so long about the value of bats that eat insects that I'll let you get in and a question or two more before we talk about other values. What does it mean when uh, you say billion dollar pest? What it... Well, corn earworm moths, army worm moths, uh, corn earworm and cotton bollworm moths are basically the same moth. But uh, these moths, can cost a billion dollars a year in farm losses. Another billion dollar a year cost comes from rootworms that hatch from cucumber beetle eggs. Bats from just a single small bat house, 200 big brown bats that could easily live in your backyard bat house, can eat enough cucumber beetles in a single summer to prevent them from laying 33 million eggs on crops. That's a hell of an impact. <laughs> Sarah Beth, she says, this is so exciting. I wish I'd met you when I was younger and gotten into bat conservation. I have a goal of drawing some bats, making cars and donating any proceeds to bat conservation. Could I and how would I get permission to potentially use some of your photos to draw. Love bats. We help anybody who's interested in helping bats. That's what we're here for. In fact, anyone who joins my new organization, Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation, you can join for free. And anybody who joins, all we ask is that when, when entities like NPR run terrible stories against bats, We'll send you an action alert, and we hope you will then protest to, to these entities that this is bad stuff and that you're not turned on by it. Uh, just for doing that, nothing more, no cost, you can become a bat fan, and bat fans can download more than 2,000 of my images, National Geographic quality pictures of bats, free of charge, you can use them. They're, they're a size that is ideal for showing people on your iPad or phone or for using PowerPoint programs. And we encourage you to share these with as many people as possible. We're up against multi-billion dollar entities trying to scare people. We've got to really get busy if we're going to counter all that. Are there, uh, Sarah Beth says, are there any bat, any bat sanctuaries with flying foxes closer to Minnesota than Michigan, Texas, or Florida? <laughs> uh, not flying foxes. Uh, flying foxes live in the old world tropics. They come from little guys that could be hidden in the palm of my hand to giants with six foot wingspans. They're an incredible group of bats, a couple hundred species or more. They're very important pollinators and seed dispersers. In fact, if it hadn't been for flying foxes, you might not today be eating bananas. The world's supply of 
commercial bananas comes from ancestors that relied on small flying fox bats for pollination. In fact, pollination and seed dispersal from bats are, are additional really important considerations almost anywhere you want to go in the world. Go to Mexico. The whole tequila industry is based on agave plant that is bat pollinated. Go to the Pacific Islands. The mangrove trees that are so important in stabilizing islands from erosion during typhoons and floods and that provide incredibly important reproductive habitat for sea-dwelling animals, bat pollinated. Go to East African savannas and the famous baobab tree, that giant, that is just incredibly uh, big ancient tree, uh, is bat pollinated. We could name bat pollinated and seed dispersed trees all over the world that are of key importance to our well-being. I'm sorry there aren't any flying foxes near Minnesota. <laughs> Sydney says Dallas and I are excited for your talk at St. Edwards tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. <laughs> I will be speaking briefly, answering questions mostly at St. Edwards tomorrow for those of you who might be in Austin. <laughs> and thank you, Dallas and Sydney, for the little promotion. <laughs> uh, Laura says, I've been a teacher here in Austin for 25 years. When I started... Uh, VCI curriculum was mandatory in our third grade science class. It was wonderful. How can we get Austin and Eans? I don't know if that's a typo. Eans? To bring back the study of bats to our students. I'm such a fan of yours. Well, the way things happen, politicians, editors, decision makers pay attention to public opinion. And if enough people ask for something, they're likely to get it. Uh, it won't happen though without people asking. Uh, I can't just go and tell the school district that people should know about bats. What you need to do is let them know how important you think bats are in this area and how important it is that your children learn some of the science side of the world they live in, some of the side that that reflects on balance of nature and what it takes to keep all of our environment healthy and bats are a critical part of that. Our bats from the Congress Avenue Bridge <clears throat> eat probably up to 15 tons of crop and yard pests every night. They bring millions of tourist dollars to Austin each summer. We have very good reasons to be paying attention to our bats and it certainly wouldn't hurt to have a bit more in our school curricula about bats and other animals that are of importance. It's very important that we learn more than just mathematics and chemistry and physics and other sciences. We've got to learn to live in harmony with the creatures around us or we're all going to be in big trouble soon. Maybe she could use some of our photos to create something for her students? I would, yes, I would also, as Teresa mentions, I would advise uh, you can download photos from my website for free and uh, we'll even help you with ideas for how to put together your own program. We've strongly encouraged that. In fact, on our resources pages, you want to pay attention to those. I spend a lot of time putting those together. I've got one directed at helping young people make career decisions uh, starting early on in school life that will probably be going up in the next few days. And uh, in those resource sections on our website, one of the things I want to do before this year is over is put together some resources where we show teachers and, and any of you watching how you can be ambassadors for bats using my photographs and my information. We're happy to provide it, no charge. We just need the ambassadorships to go out there and do the work. Mm -hmm. Stephanie says, how does a girl in Chicago make an impact? I would like to do conservation work with bats during the summer. 
the first way you can have an impact is start speaking up when you hear people maligning bats as being dangerous. I mean, you don't have to go very far to hear people spreading word about how you can get Ebola or rabies or something from a bat. You can do an awful lot just by starting, when you hear things like that, to be well informed. You know, don't just say that's not true. Uh, go again to our resource pages and on any of these subjects you can find detailed documentation. One of the documents currently on our website under resources is an article that I wrote for Issues in Science and Technology. It's in the current issue, edition right now. And in that article, you can find anything you'd ever need to tell somebody just about regarding why they don't need to be worried about bats harming them, why they should be worried about us harming bats. Margarita says, what do you think about the society role in bat conservation? <sighs> what do I think of the society role in bat conservation? Well, Unfortunately, I guess I don't have a really great opinion of society role, given that, Majority. you know, even today, even right here in Austin, where we're gaining millions of dollars a summer in tourism benefits from our bats, and where we're having them eat so many pests out of our yards, uh, we still run into people who are afraid of bats and, and want to tell you all about how you can get Ebola or something from bats. Uh, at the time that I founded Bat Conservation International back in 1982, everybody, my friends, my colleagues, thought I was absolutely insane to resign a top full-time research position to try to found an organization solely for bats. I think the record stands pretty much for itself. If even one person really effectively sticks up and shares the truth about bats, it's amazing how that can spread and change things. But back in those days, there wasn't a single major traditional conservation organization that wanted to touch bats with a 10-foot pole. And even today, you'll find conservation organizations lined up competing for who gets the biggest share of revenue from protecting pandas or something cute, but you won't find a whole lot of competition for bats. And that's partly our fault. We've got to get out there and let people everywhere know how dependent we are on healthy ecosystems and how essential bats are to those systems. Sharon's asking, what research has been done to verify how much Ebola is attributed to flying fox or microbats in African continent? Well, it's been speculated for quite a number of years, going back to at least 05 or 2005 or before, that Ebola was coming from bats. But it's speculation, uh, pure speculation. Back in the summer of 2014, as the Ebola epidemic was warming up in West Africa, heating up, uh, the National Institute of Health, NIH, had a press conference at which they reported that they had now traced Ebola back to a single two-year-old toddler who got it from a three-foot wingspan strocklered fruit bat, a flying fox. I vociferously protested and apparently got heard. I point out, how in the world can you come to this conclusion when a research team visited this boy's village, caught lots of bats, examined them for Ebola, couldn't find <clears throat> any evidence of Ebola, nor could they find any evidence that this little toddler had ever been near a fruit bat. And here's a bat with a three-foot wingspan that never enters human habitations. And somehow he bit this poor little kid and gave him Ebola without anybody even knowing about it? Well, so, a few months later, they sent another research team out to find out how the, they, they were now in agreement that the toddler was the first index case. So they sent another 
team out to investigate. And this team publishes a 30 author paper saying, oh, well, um, we didn't find any evidence that, that it was fruit bats. We think it was actually free tail bats, insect eating bats that gave this poor little boy Ebola. So what was the evidence? This new team examined 12, 12 or 13 species, at least 12 species of bats for Ebola virus. They found nothing. And they found no evidence whatsoever that I would call evidence. What they did find was that this little boy had played at least near a hollow tree that contained several thousand free tail bats. So he must have gotten it from those free tail bats. Now, let me point out that in that same period of time, teenage boys from the same village were killing and eating these bats, and none of the people who ate the bats got Ebola. Only this poor little boy that we don't even know if he had contact is speculated then to have gotten Ebola. Since then, it's been pointed out that existing research points in very different directions. And this is where you need to read my, my article uh, in, this, in the current issue. of the, there, You'll see a link. In the comments. Above the point. comments. Okay, above the comments, you can find a link to it. And I give you much more detail in, in that story. But let me point out that um, the fruit bats have several times been brought up as, as, you know, almost certain to be the source. But one of the first things that was thought to be almost certain making them the source was that when they were artificially infected with Ebola in a laboratory setting, they didn't get sick. They got infected, but they didn't get sick. Okay. But the part you don't usually hear is that these bats that didn't get sick also never shed virus. You've got to shed virus in order to transmit it to anything. There's still absolutely not a shred of proof that a bat of any kind has ever transferred an Ebola virus to any other animal. And now major agencies are starting to reevaluate their hunt for example, we now know that there are, I think, four different kinds of, like, species of Ebola virus in, in Africa, and each one is confined to a different river drainage. That does not imply bats. They're saying, oh, it's probably bats because bats migrate and cover long distances. Well, if that's the case, come on, somebody tell me why is our four different species of Ebola, each one restricted to a different river drainage if bats are flying over large areas dispersing it. This makes it look like it has something to do with an animal that's aquatic or associated with river drainages at least that's probably not flying around. There is a lot of evidence but unfortunately it's like mirrors. When mirrors was discovered some scientists literally went right out on a limb and almost staked their lives on this was going to be a bad origin. But uh, the truth is that when they finally quit trying to pin it on bats, they found all the evidence you could ever want that camels were serving as the reservoir for mirrors. Had the same evidence been found in bats, I'm sure the same people would have said, case closed, we've got the culprits. But in the case of camels, there are still people out spending large sums of money trying to prove that the camels must have somewhere along the line gotten it from bats, despite the fact that there's good evidence that it's been in camels for a long time and that even if bats had something to do with it in evolutionary history, it's probably pretty irrelevant to what's going on today. Uh, Stephanie says, my partner is a PhD in microbiology and looking at things to combat fungal infections. How can he help work into this field? 
of bats, I assume. Combating fungal infections. I think you may have me there. I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, it is a fungus. This what is? Not, I'm going to tell you. There is a fungus that causes white nose syndrome that was accidentally introduced somehow into the United States. We don't know whether it came on a person's clothing or whether it came in a bat that hitchhiked in a shipping container. We don't know how it got here. But uh, there has been a lot of research on white nose syndrome recently. And of course, being that's a fungus, I suppose that's a connection for somebody interested in fungi. But while I'm on that subject, which I wasn't intending to deal with this, this evening, let me point out that yes, white nose syndrome has killed millions of American bats. But don't pay any attention to anybody who's telling you that if you just give them more money, they're going to find a cure for white nose syndrome. It's not going to happen. Even if you could find a cure tomorrow, there is no way that we could practically treat all the thousands, tens of thousands of places where bats hibernate in America. And if you didn't treat them all, it would still come back from somewhere. And even if you tried vaccinating the bats, I mean, my God, think of trying to vaccinate all the millions of bats in America. It's hopeless. What we really need to be doing to white nose syndrome right now is instead of running into caves all the time to check and see how the bats are doing, we need to right now as never before leave these bats alone in winter. They're dying because white nose syndrome, like other kinds of fungi, if you've ever had athlete's foot or chiggers or something that makes you itch, you know it's hard to sleep at night. You wake up and you scratch. Well, these bats are trying to hibernate and every time they have to wake up in a cold cave when they shouldn't, they're using a month to two months stored fat supply. So by going in to check on them all the time, we are probably substantially increasing their risk of death. And we're not doing anything to save them because we don't have any treatment or any cure. And the bats themselves travel such large areas that they are going to spread it everywhere it can go to every species that is susceptible in America and there's nothing we can do to stop that. We might maybe slow it slightly but I'm quite sure we can't slow it much. Bats move over long distances. The good news is that, now you often don't hear the good news, as in so many cases there are plenty of people who are getting good sized grants to try to find a cure for, Ebo for WNS and they're not real quick to tell you that bats are already beginning to show recovery. The little brown bat, the species most affected by white nose syndrome in America, or one of the two or three most affected, is already beginning to rebuild resistant populations in the northeast where, where white nose syndrome first was apparently introduced. Many of our U.S. species are either marginally susceptible to white nose syndrome or are resistant entirely. It's not affecting all of our bats, and even the ones that have been affected are beginning to slowly find resistant ones that can rebuild populations. This is a time as never before when we should be deeply concerned about helping bats. Our populations are at all-time lows. They're facing uh, threats, huge threats, beyond white nose syndrome. That's what you hear about. I remember recently hearing about how white nose syndrome had suddenly arrived in Texas. Oh boy, watch out. Uh, really? That same story should have been talking about the 11,000 wind turbines we have in Texas already operating, which because of lax environmental laws, Nobody is monitoring, and we know that they preferentially kill our free tail bats. Uh, but, you know, nobody really has been able so far to put a stop to this, so it's much easier to tell you about we're looking for a cure for something that's going to eventually take care of itself, 
instead of dealing with something controversial and difficult. Now, I, I hope we can get back to the original topic. I didn't mean to get completely sidetracked. Yeah, people have lots of questions, so we'll definitely have to do this again and address these specific topics. Um, we've got uh, some questions about bat boxes, wind farms. <laughs> um, Let's talk about bat boxes. Okay, I'll read you that question. Uh, Jim says he installed 50 bat shelters on uh, in California, and they weighed about 200 pounds and were really hard to install, 70 feet in the air at various points. Wow. And I'm impressed. I have a lightweight copy of these boxes. What is your opinion of concrete versus lightweight concrete coated foam for these shelters in terms of thermal preference? Well, you'd have to try them. And I know concrete has been used in small bad houses in Europe, but I'm not convinced that concrete is absolutely essential to success. The most successful bad house builder I know of in America when it comes to large ones is making them out of wood. No concrete involved at all. Uh, I, I certainly, my hat goes off to anybody that is brave enough to try to put concrete bad houses 70, did I hear right, 70 That's feet up. That's what it says. Uh, anyway, uh, you don't have to go to that kind of extreme to attract bats. Uh, but there are some things that bats really are looking for in bat houses. Don't buy or even build and put up a bat house that doesn't have roosting. Now, different species have different preferences, but our crevice roosters, the ones that most frequently use bat houses, typically want crevices about three quarters of an inch wide. Not more than an inch or an inch and a quarter absolute max, but you're better off at three quarters inch. And I can demonstrate that by going down to our bridges in town and walking along and looking at, at the widths of crevices between concrete uh, box beams in the bridges. And when the, when the crevices get more than an inch and a half wide, you'll find almost no bats, but you'll find lots of bats stuffed into them when they're three quarters inch to an inch. And they'll vary some down to half an inch and up to, uh, an inch and a half, but most people when they go to buy or build a bat house, they think, ah, oh, bats can't get into that little space, and they try to give them more space. They don't, crevice roosting bats don't want more space, and let me give you an interesting aside while we're on that. Just imagine yourself as a bat in a little space like this, and Mr. Snake comes along, your worst enemy in your roost, wants a meal. All you have to do is open your mouth and Mr. Snake sticks his nose in and gets bit. If you're in a bigger crevice, Mr. Snake grabs you and you go down the tube. So there's a real good reason why bats like these narrow crevices. And also they want crevices that are adequately rough. I think that one of the most common causes of non-use is inadequately roughened crevice crevices and landing areas and, and bats would like to swoop up a little bit and like get into a little bit of protection before they have to pause and crawl into the crevice and that's because owls will wait and try to pounce on them as they come in and since most bats rear only one young a year they can't afford to have a whole lot of loss to predators so they have to be very careful. Another issue is your bat houses need to be you know, we're finding that even in places like Florida and Texas, medium, medium brown, sometimes even fairly dark brown bat houses don't overheat too much. Now, it is important to give bats a chance at venting, and we're, we're going to get into this in a different webinar. I don't want to get into it too much now, but be sure wherever you live that your bat houses are getting plenty of sun every day. Yeah, he was, he's an engineering contractor. He's in California, and he's, he put them on the freeway overpass for Caltrans. He's working with Stephanie Remington. Oh, I'm, um, I'm, I, got Cal, I was the one that got Caltrans first involved with bats. Uh, two of their employees came to one of my workshops. Uh, I, 
I would assume that you're being successful with those, and I would very much enjoy uh, if you send a, a, a email to our website. I'd be very happy to hear about what's going on here and update from you. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> um, we've got some more questions. Do you, how do you feel, Merlin? Do you have anything else to say about the topic, or do you want to take some of these other questions? Well, um, how far are we straying away? Are we off of disease now? It's whatever you want. Let, let me say one more thing about disease. You might be wondering why anybody would want to, you know, almost lie about bats when it comes to scaring you about disease. Well, I can tell you, when bat, you know, disease is such a non-issue that we didn't even discover that humans could get sick from bats until the 1950s. That's the first time we even knew that a bat could have rabies. Once we found that they could, people started looking for rabies in bats, so we started discovering more rabies in bats, and then health departments, with the boost budgets, they would show you graphs of the incidence of rabid bats reported, and it would just be going almost geometrically up, and you'd think, oh, wow, this is terrible. We've got a plague of you know, rabies outbreak in bats. No, we didn't have a plague of rabies outbreak in bats. We had a plague of people looking for rabies in bats. And the proportion of bats found rabid remained the same the whole time. But the rabies and pest control industries profited enormously from the discovery of that, that bats could have sometimes a few of them have rabies in America. In fact, at the time that I first got involved in bat conservation, single pest control companies were making millions of dollars a summer in single cities, scaring people about bats. And in fact, the things they were doing were far more dangerous than bats could have ever been. I was living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time as a curator of mammals at their Milwaukee Public Museum. And so I would get the calls from panicked people. People would call me, oh my God, uh, I saw a bat in our yard last night. And I'd say, well, you know, is that an issue? Oh yeah, 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 I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got children. Uh, yeah, well, did the bat attack anybody? Well, no. Uh, what was the bat doing? Oh, it was flying around. <laughs> and so somebody like that would call a pest control company, and if they got the pest control company before me, major national name pest control companies would come out and they would save you from bats. What they would do is they'd bring a canister of methyl bromide, something more dangerous than cyanide, cost them less than ten dollars for a canister they would tell the family to move out of their home for three days and nights while they fumigated all they had to do was drop the canister in the door slam the door and run and uh... come back three days later and take take it out they would charge five hundred dollars for that i documented that very very well and not only that, but when the people would come home, they would call me on the phone and say, we just paid $500 to have the bats taken care of in our house, and they're still in the attic, and the house stinks. And I'd say, if the house stinks, get out of there immediately. Methyl bromide is so dangerous that humans have become living vegetables from amounts of methyl bromide that they didn't even detect. They didn't even smell it at the time. And then when I talked to people that were even more knowledgeable about the substance, they pointed out that it could cause fire hazards by dissolving insulation on electrical wiring. But this was all happening in the name of protecting people from bats. They were creating problems that were far more dangerous than bats could have ever been. And I, I can tell you that even today, scaring people is lucrative. Anybody who's really going out of his way to scare you about bats is someone who's benefiting from your fear. It's a virtual guarantee.
why bats? Why is it easy to scare people about bats? Why not a different animal? Well, that's a good question. Why bats? Bats are incredibly susceptible because people don't know much about them. We naturally fear most what we understand least, and they don't know much about viruses either. You know that NPR story about bats' bodies being covered with viruses, their spit, their poop, full of viruses. All that is equally true of you and me. We have more viruses in our bodies than we have cells. It stands to reason that a very large proportion of those viruses may actually be essential to our very survival. They're certainly not all lethal, but we only hear about the tiny fraction that could kill us and that can scare us. Well, given the tradition of people fearing what they don't understand, what better thing than to link poorly understood bats and poorly understood viruses? And let me point out another thing while we're on this. It seems like every time one of these people that's gotten huge grants to look for viruses and bats, they call them virus hunters, every time one of them reports a new virus discovery in a bat, it gets reported like, oh my God, this is related to herpes, or this is related to flu, or this is, you know, it's, or it's related to Ebola. All life on Earth is related at some level. We are 96% genomically identical to chimpanzees. Read your article. Yeah, I read, read my article. But um, when the first link was made saying that um, SARS came from bats, it was because they found a virus in bats, a coronavirus, that was 80-some percent related to the one that was killing people. Well, coronaviruses are really common. You can find them anywhere you want to look in the world. They're in whales, they're in birds. I don't know where you'd look that you can't find a coronavirus. They're the source of colds in humans. It would be very easy to say that almost any coronavirus you found anywhere was somehow related to the one that caused SARS. We have to be very careful what we accept as truth. One of the problems here about a lot of this disease issue is that the more times it gets repeated as speculation, the firmer it gets founded in people's mind as fact. And in fact, there are an awful lot of virologists today that probably believe it too because they've heard it so many. I mean, there are thousands of papers in which what's interesting is the first paper speculates that this data might indicate this disease came from bats. Then somebody later publishes another scientific paper. The study isn't really even about this, but in the introduction they say, because bats are the known source of XYZ diseases, this study was important. Well, all of a sudden, the speculation in the first paper became fact in the second one, but only in the introduction, and reviewers don't really look that hard at your introduction. They're looking to see if you interpreted your data right. So there's an awful lot of backdoor sneaky stuff going on that has convinced the world now that bats are incredibly dangerous, when in fact they probably have our planet's finest safety record of living with people. Um, so I'm going to re quickly read through some of the rest of these questions, and if you want to touch on any of them, we can do that now, or, or we can plan for another time to answer these specific questions. We'll go for the hour we said we'd go for, and okay. we'll have more webinars. Yeah. Um, Javier is from Chile, and he's personally interested in ways to help in new legislation to regulate activities on wind farms and this impact on bats. Do you have any opinion about that? There are lots of things that wind farms could do to reduce mortality. We've known for probably a decade now at least that just by changing what we call the cut-in speed for turbines, this is the wind speed at which the turbine starts turning in the, in the, in the wind to produce power. Most bat kills occur at low wind speeds when we're producing very little, if any, power. 
it's my suspicion that an awful lot of turbines get spun at those low wind speeds in part uh, so that everybody will think they're always producing energy. They're not. Wind turbines only produce energy in a fairly narrow range of wind speed. If it's too slow or too fast, they can't be used to produce energy. Studies have shown that by just saying we're not going to start the blades spinning until the wind is just a little bit stronger, those companies could be saving anywhere from from 40 to 90 percent of bat kills at a cost of less than three percent, usually less than one percent of energy output. And you can read the links that are in the comments about further wind industry. Oh, and, and, and if you want to know more about wind industry and what should and could happen, go to our resource page on wind in industry. You can link in the comments too. Yeah, we've linked it in the comments. You, uh, Teresa has. Uh, Steph says, how do you feel about the proposed Northeast Pipeline? Species have been decimated in the proposed states. How would this affect the remaining individuals? Uh, I'm not one to take sides on issues like that. Uh, I know there's, a, there's recently been a, uh, a proposal for a 50-year agreement to negotiate a 50-year agreement with gas companies for pipelines. Uh, agreement with Fish and Wildlife Service and what I saw was an awful lot of organizations jumping on that and sending out <clears throat> quick alerts to everybody under the sun saying Fish and Wildlife Service is thinking of negotiating a 50-year uh, agreement with gas companies. Now it's just kind of assumed that gas companies are all bad because they're gas companies. First of all let me point out and this is food for a whole nother webinar, uh, producers of petroleum, gas, timber, minerals, they're all working for us. We had to have to go back to living in caves and teepees if it wasn't for these industries. It actually worked for us, but we like to assume that they're all universally bad. There is no way in the world we're going to solve our world problems by assuming that some whole entity is all bad. I don't think that it was bad that the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed negotiating with these power companies. What could have been bad and might still be bad is if a bad deal is negotiated. But when people want to negotiate in good faith and they want to acknowledge that these companies actually do work for us, they're essential to our lifestyles, Saving bats in the environment is also essential to us in our lifestyles. A lot of the people working for those companies, actually, you'd be surprised how often they would agree with us with regard to the end result of what they would like to see, but they never get a chance to agree with us because we're so busy kicking shins just because they're gas companies and gas companies have to be bad. So what I saw come out of the recent, I saw a flurry of activity and it looked to me more like a membership drive to get people to join organizations and give money. We've got to stop these bad guys. Everybody, you know, we don't say it, but we all know they're bad. Uh, we don't have to stop anybody. We need to find common ground solutions where we win more friends and fewer battles. And let's end on that. That's fo food for yet another webinar one day. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Teresa is... So join us next week, same time. We'll do another topic. I'm assuming right. that I'm going to be here next week at the same time. <laughs> Have you looked at my calendar, yeah. Teresa? <clears throat> yep. Teresa says I can be here next week at the same time. <laughs> if so, I very much enjoyed speaking with all of you, and we'll be back. Yeah, sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but there'll be more opportunities. We'll do our best. Thank you.